<laughs> hey everyone, Chef Alia here, and tonight I'm going to be working with my sous chef to be making two veggie recipes, two of my favorite veggie recipes. One of them is a sweet potato wedges with chili and cinnamon, and the other one is charred with pine nuts and feta cheese. Actually, I'm out of pine nuts, so we'll be doing something a little different tonight. But if you have pine nuts, that's great. Um, you can find these recipes on my blog at agoodcarrot.com. The roasted sweet potato ones is one of the first ones. If you just scroll to the bottom, um, it'll be right there on the left. And the charred one, you have to search in the little search function at the top. If you just type in charred, it'll come up one of the top two or three charred with um, pine nuts and feta cheese. Yeah, so... Let's get started here. So first we're gonna do the sweet potatoes and for that one you need to, what do you need to do? Cut them? Preheat the oven. Oh. Can you yeah. preheat the oven for me? What? 425. So while Elizabeth, my sous chef, is preheating the oven, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sweet potatoes and yams. What's that? Perfect. Thank you, Lizzie. So who knows what these are? These are sweet potatoes. Hi, Sasha. These are sweet potatoes. And who knows the difference between a sweet potato and a yam? I'm going to answer that question for you right now. So in this country, um, we call a lot of things yams that are actually sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes and yams are actually two different botanical things. And the most commonly used thing that we see in this country are sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes can come in many different colors. This one happens to be orange on the inside. It's called a garnet sweet potato, not a garnet yam, but a garnet sweet potato. There's white sweet potatoes, purple sweet potatoes, all manner of sweet potatoes. When you get into yams, it's actually a whole different plant, botanically speaking. It's kind of starchier. You don't really see them in the regular supermarket as much. Um, so these are sweet potatoes. I just needed to give you a little botanical lesson there. And today we're making the sweet potato wedges. And I'm actually going to leave the peel on with these. I just use a little scrub brush here. I find that the peel gets soft enough, I don't need to bother to peel them. So I, I used a veggie brush and I just scrubbed them really well just to get all the dirt off and any little really thick parts that I wanted to get off of there, but just scrubbed them. And now I will put them into wedges. I like wedges better than fries. I like eating big, thick wedges for my sweet potatoes. And Elizabeth's gonna help me. Do you wanna peel some garlic? Okay. Okay. So she's gonna help me by peeling some garlic, just four cloves of garlic. Ow. And to peel the garlic, she's gonna take it out of the garlic here and then she's gonna bang on it with her knife. She's got her little, can I show them your knife? She's got her little mini knife. If you have any kids that are cooking, this is mama knife. This is baby knife. Really similar knives, just one's a bit smaller. She feels really comfortable cutting out this one. It's, a, it's technically a boning knife, but it works really well for her. So she's just going to bang those garlic cloves, and we're going to leave them whole, actually, for this dish. And I'm going to get to work on these sweet potato wedges. Let's see, sweet potatoes come in all shapes and sizes, so when you're making your wedges, you just want to guess as to which kind of size that you want to eat. The other day I had really long and skinny ones, and I actually cut them in half crosswise and then made wedges out of them. These are actually shorter and stubbier ones. Hi Kathleen! Um, shorter and stubbier ones, so I'm going to actually probably just do these across like this, so that's in half lengthwise. And then I'll do each, like, can you see my cutting board? I can't see my cutting board. So we just get nice wedges. These are what I used to uh, get. The size, the shape to me, these wedges, used to be something called Jojo Potatoes. Does anybody know what those are? I used to get those at the grocery store when I lived in Seattle. They were already cooked. Hi, Veronica. Four. So wedges. Four. Lizzie has, yeah, two. Do I do the smaller Two ones? more. Let's just stick with the bigger ones. Perfect, yeah. So I got my wedges here. So that's a wedge. You can do them smaller than that, they'll cook faster. I like the feeling of a nice big wedge. 
So that was one potato and it yielded about eight wedges. And I have a bowl here. I'm gonna put everything in the bowl because I'm gonna coat it with all the stuff. If you guys are following along in the recipe, all the stuff. The cinnamon, the chili, the olive oil. I think that's it. So here we go with this one. Can you see my cutting board? So we'll go in half lengthwise. I don't think it can because of the things. Yeah, I don't know if... I'm not sure. So we'll cut each potato into wedges. And this is a little over a pound of sweet potatoes here. And I say in the recipe it serves about um, four people. Kind of depends on how hungry your people are. <laughs> so I'm just cutting them up here and putting them in a big bowl. So I'm going to mix them all up here. Done. Perfect. And Elizabeth is going to put her peeled garlic cloves in here. Show them to the camera. So she just peeled four whole garlic cloves. And for this recipe, I keep them whole. So go ahead and throw them in there. Perfect. And I have a little bowl here for garbage if you want. Oh, we'll use those another time. That's fine. And then we'll do this last sweet potato here. So some nice big wedges. Nice and thick. You can just leave that there. It's fine. You should do it the garlic. I'll just leave it there. It's fine. We'll use it for the next recipe. So I have these big wedges, I filled up the bowl here, and the next step is going to be to drizzle them with a spice mixture of cinnamon and some olive oil. What does the recipe say? Can you look on the recipe what it says over there? Oops, scroll up. So what do we have? One tablespoon of olive oil. One tablespoon of olive oil. Uh, Aleppo pepper. And then Aleppo pepper. Uh, cinnamon and salt. Cinnamon and salt. Black pepper. Great. So what I like to do when I'm coating things with an oil mixture is that I combine it all in a little bowl and then I pour it over the, the bigger thing, the sweet potatoes in this case. So I'm going to take about a tablespoon of olive oil. Do you want to measure out the spices in here? Okay. As I do this. So... One teaspoon. So I have about a tablespoon of olive oil. I'm not measuring this. I'm going to eyeball this one. Tablespoon. Does that look like a tablespoon? Sure, that looks like a tablespoon. And then she's going to measure out the Aleppo pepper. So a little bit about the Aleppo pepper. If you ever see that, Aleppo pepper is a pepper that specifically comes from uh, the Turkey, Eastern Turkey and Syria area. And it's actually a sun-dried pepper that's um, grown and dried all over uh, the agricultural regions there. Its flavor is, it depends on where you get it from, but its flavor is a little bit fruity. Um, the one I get is not super spicy. I like kind of the less spicy one. It means that everybody can in the family can eat it. Um, and you can find it, I get it either, when I'm out of the stuff that I've brought back from Turkey, I get it at either Penzi Spices or Savory Spice Shop. Those are both places you can go online to get them. And also um, Savory Spice Shop, if you're in Southern California, they have a store in uh, Costa Mesa. And then Penzi's has a store in Torrance too. And it's always worth a, a trip to the Spice Shop, right? Spice Shop's super exciting. You have to smell all the things. So Elizabeth here, she's put, what, a teaspoon of the Aleppo pepper. If you are using red pepper flakes, I wouldn't put nearly that much. These Aleppo pep pepper flakes really are not very spicy. Hi, Alex. Thanks for stopping in. Uh, the Aleppo pepper flakes really aren't super spicy, so she put a whole teaspoon. If you're using, like, a red pepper flake, I would cut that back unless you like it pretty spicy. And then what was it, like a half a teaspoon of cinnamon? Mm -hmm. And a half a teaspoon of cinnamon in the olive oil. It is ready to add salt and pepper. Yeah. And she's also going to add the salt and pepper to this too. Three-fourths. So I do three of these mm -hmm. for teaspoon. Yeah. So she's going to do three-quarters of a teaspoon of this fine sea salt. And the sea salt that I use still has some minerals in it. I really like the flavor of this, and we can all do it with some extra minerals in our diet. So it's uh, the Redmond sea salt, the fine sea salt that I like to use. 
And I put everything together in an oil mixture because why? Anybody know why? Why do I put it all together in an oil mixture? Hi, Fairy Day. So I put it together in an oil mixture. Everybody gives up, right? Because oil or fat carries flavor, right? If you were just to sprinkle the spices on top, even if you mixed them all together and then just sprinkled them on top, um, they wouldn't, you wouldn't taste them as much in the final product. With the fat, it helps carry the flavor all around the, the sweet potatoes and you're gonna taste it a lot more in the final, in the final dish. So this is, that's why we do mix together the olive oil or the fat, whatever you're using with the spices here. It's gonna, it's gonna help the dish taste better, basically. Yes. Yeah, and then she just puts salt and then we're gonna do some freshly ground black pepper. And that's it for the spice mix. Let me grab a little spoon. And because I had a little bit over a pound of sweet potatoes, I'm going to do a little bit more than a tablespoon of olive oil. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at my pile of sweet potatoes and I think I need a little bit more. Mmm, that black pepper smells good. I love freshly ground black pepper. Hi, Erin. Thanks for coming by. Who's Erin? An old beach green customer. So I just added a little bit more oil and the spice mixture is still super concentrated so we're good to go here. And like I was saying before, if you don't have the Aleppo pepper, which is a fruity, slightly spicy pepper, you can use a red pepper flake as well. But Aleppo pepper is also super easy to order online or to find at a local spice shop like Penzi's or Savory Spice Shop. It's becoming more and more common these days or in a Middle Eastern grocery if you happen to be at one. So. I have my sweet potatoes all cut into wedges in a bowl. And I'm gonna go ahead and pour this over and then just use my hands to mix it all up. Is this the one you made that I thought was okay but a little spicy? Yeah, so Elizabeth said she thought it was okay but it was a little spicy. So you can totally cater this dish to whoever is eating it. And it's gonna be the same spiciness tonight. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. But I think you can handle it. Yeah. The, the cool thing about the Aleppo pepper is that it's not super duper spicy, right? She is a pro. I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. And you know, sweet potatoes, if you're, they come in all different shapes and sizes, right? And if you have a hard time finding um, exactly a pound of sweet potatoes, just get as close as you can here. And I'm just mixing them together with my hands so that they're nice and coated. Can we see that? Coated with the spice mixture. Here. Yeah, and then we're gonna put them. Let me wash my hands really quickly. And then we're gonna put them on a sheet tray. Can I show it? What's that? Can I show it? Sure. Ew. So we have a sheet tray, a rimmed baking sheet here, that I've lined with parchment paper. Does anybody out there use parchment paper? Anybody? I do. <laughs> I like using parchment paper. A big reason is cleanup. It makes cleanup a lot easier. It also helps with the browning a little bit, um, kind of depending on what you're making, but it does help with the browning. And these sweet potatoes, potatoes, I will actually flip halfway in the middle so that they get evenly browned on both sides. Very day, yeah. I love parchment paper. For, for me, the big reason is the cleanup, because instead of getting all the stuff stuck to the the tray. You get, um, you could just take off the parchment paper and the tray's pretty much clean, right? I like that about it. So do you want to put those okay. on there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where should I do it? Actually, you know, these didn't get super well coated. However you want. I think lining them up evenly is good. And if it's too much, we will use another tray. So the key to roasting, another key to getting, um, another key to getting brown or roasting what did you add to the oil? Miss that part. Oh, it is Aleppo pepper, a teaspoon of Aleppo pepper, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and then just salt and pepper. Super simple. You can add other stuff if you wanted. If you wanted to do cumin or coriander, you could go crazy. All spice. I mean, but this one I just get pumpkin pie spice. I thought about that after I made this recipe. I was like, ah, oh, it's pumpkin pie spice season. Not something that I'm super into, but 
you could totally do the pumpkin pie spice, which has the cloves in it. So whatever you want. I just think the mix of like the kind of sweeter, if you will, sweeter sort of spices with the chili is a really nice combination. I like that a little bit of kick and then a little bit of, of the warming spices. Like the cinnamon is a warming spice. It makes you feel all warm inside. In the cold, freezing cold weather that we're having. <laughs> You're welcome for a day. I have to sneeze, speaking of the weather. Uh. Okay, maybe not. So, Elizabeth is putting these wedges on the rimmed baking sheet and the thing with these with getting vegetables brown when you're roasting is that you don't want to put them too close together. I need too close together. No this is going to be just perfect. It's a little bit on the line but I think we'll be good. If you crowd the vegetables too much in the pan they will steam instead of roast and you really won't get any browning on them at all. Right, so what you're doing when you're browning is you're getting rid of excess moisture. You're basically getting rid of the water in it, and then the Malliard reaction happens, right? The browning happens. That's perfect. I'm going to show them. Oh, yeah, and the garlic, too. So the browning reaction happens, and you get the nice browning on them, that caramelization, that yummy, yummy flavor. So she, look at that. She lined them up so nicely. You wouldn't really want it any more crowded than this. This is about the most you want. Otherwise, like I said, they'll just kind of steam. They won't really brown at all. Yeah. So in this cinnamon, Aleppo pepper, salt pepper, mm -hmm. and those garlic cloves, I like to leave them whole. The oven's at 425, and they're just going to soften and brown a little bit. They won't um, blacken or get bitter or anything, but I like leaving them whole. If you want to cut them up, that would work too. They might uh, burn a little bit if you cut them up. So upon, hi, it's good to see you. Um, they might, if you cut up the garlic, it might brown a little bit, too much. So I like to leave them whole, and I'm the person who likes that, like, treat of roasted garlic, right? Elizabeth, I know, she's hired, isn't she? I totally agree with you, Veronica. Totally. So we're going to put this in the oven at 425 until they're done, which is 20 minutes. I like roasting at a pretty high temperature, like, like 425. Things get done quick. And they get a nice toast on them too. So we're gonna go ahead and stick them in there. And we'll set the timer for 20 minutes and we'll check them then. And we'll move on to the char. So a little bit, you wanna pull up the char one? It's on the other screen. A little bit about this menu. I put it together just thinking about veggie dishes for Thanksgiving, really. I mean, it, if you wanted to eat only veggies for dinner, that is super terrific. But if you needed something a little more, you could add a protein or something to go alongside of these. Um, but I was thinking of stuff that's super easy and could be actually made ahead of time. These sweet potato wedges would be really good just served at room temperature. They'd be fine. And you'll see what our crowning moment is with those two. If you're looking at the recipe, you'll see that I have a little bit of pomegranate molasses that we drizzle over the top at the end, which is super, <gasps> Elizabeth says, <gasps> that is super yummy, I think. So that, and then the chard here is an everyday recipe, but it's also a really nice side dish for Thanksgiving. I don't know if, I'm always the one that brings the green stuff to Thanksgiving, or is expected to bring the green stuff. <clears throat> and this chard makes a really nice recipe. Yay, thanks, Brady. Woo. So the chard really makes a nice side dish. Um, I also have cinnamon in the chard, so let's move on to that. I'll talk all about greens and chard in a minute. So Swiss chard or chard. You'll notice here that I'm actually, I took it out of my fridge, I store it, it's just a bunch of greens, I store it in a damp tea towel. So this is a huge, it's actually a flour sack towel. It's a huge flour sack towel that when I brought this home, I just wrapped it up in it and then I ran it under the, um, the water, the sink, and just made it damp and shoved it in the produce drawer. Right, so the whole thing with keeping produce fresh is just all about the moisture level. Things start to wilt, 
when they don't have enough moisture in them. So this helps keep things wet and but still being able to breathe. The reason things kind of get all gross and plastic is because they can't breathe in there. So while they're staying nice and wet, they get all slimy, especially greens. Have you ever had greens get super slimy if you store them in plastic in the refrigerator? Yes, I have. <laughs> it's because they can't breathe in there. So this is my new way of storing things. It's a super added bonus that it's without plastic. And you, you just keep a bunch of these on hand. You wash them in between using them. It works really well. There's a ton of different kinds of Swiss chard. This one I chose, I think I chose rainbow. This looks like rainbow, right? Yeah, all different kinds here. There's a regular, regular Swiss chard, which has just white stalks on it. Yeah, it says rainbow. And then there's ones that are only red or ones that are only yellow. They all have a similar flavor to them. And so the Swiss chard, I actually, it's related to spinach and beets as well. It is pretty. I totally agree. I think that's why I chose it, Sasha, because <laughs> it was the prettiest one in the store, right? Do you think the flavor is different, Sasha, with the yellow one? That's what I was trying to decide if there's a different flavor between the ones. Sasha's asking, she's saying she likes the yellow the best, and I'm wondering if there's a different flavor. I'm not sure. Um, so we're going to use both the stalks and the leaves on the in this recipe which is great so the only thing with using both is that they cook at different rates so the stalk is crispy like a celery or like an onion oh the yellow is good to use in place of celery that's good to know i learned something cool um so i'm going to use the stalks and i'm going to saute them with the onion as well so we don't have to throw out the stalks just use them all in the same dish and to separate the leaves here instead of cutting them out I'm just going to start them with my hand, start tearing them here, and then I'm just going to pull, and it's going to come right off. So now I have a leaf, no stalk, a stalk that I'm going to cut up. Yeah, red stains everything. I agree. I kind of stay away from the red chart a lot of times because it makes everything I want to make perfect. You stick it there. Um, it makes things red or even kind of a brown color. So Elizabeth so easy a 10 year old can do it good job she just went ahead and tore that off I'm gonna put these in the sink to wash them you can try this with any kind of green say hi Sasha she says hi, hi. <laughs> uh, you can do this with any kind of green with chard it works with collards it works with kale it works it's really convenient has anybody ever spent a bunch of time trying to get the stalks out of the leaves? That one's huge. Can you do that one? Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of time to cut them out, so it's really nice to just do this. Right? She's awesome. Look at that. It just comes right off. It's amazing. That one was huge. It's like there's still some, like, left thing. That's okay. Yeah, a little bit. That's fine. It's totally fine. It smells really good in here. Okay, last one. Just go ahead and rip. So try this, you guys, next time if you're not already doing it. Can you rinse these for me? Yeah. Just with the sprayer? Yeah. Try to keep it in the sink. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait. Let me use this real quick. All right. So Elizabeth is washing the char. And this recipe calls for a little bit of onion. And it calls for a small onion, I think. What does the recipe say? A small onion. And if I don't have a small onion on hand, I'll just use a half an onion. Because I find that too much, I prefer more chard than onion in this recipe. So I'll just use, this is a medium onion to me. So I'm just gonna use half of it and save the other half for something else. Thank you. So cut it in half. And then just peel it. Did you know that onions are really easiest to peel when they're um, cut in half? They're really hard to peel when they're not cut in half, so it's beneficial to cut them in half anyways. And then we're just gonna dice it. Is that, does the recipe say dice? Dice. Okay, great. You can do either way. You can do like little slices for this, or you can do diced. I'll do diced just to show you diced. Can you guys see my cutting board? I know I've asked you that a ton of times. I can see it. Can you? All right, over here. 
So to dice it here, I just took off that outer, um, the peel, and then holding it with uh, the palm of my hand, basically the heel of my hand, I'm going to cut through, but not all the way through the root. You'll notice that I cut off the top end which is the part where the onion grows, and I left the root end where all these little hairs are. I left those, those are the little roots that grow into the ground. So I left those intact so that when I'm dicing my onion, it makes it a lot easier. It's not sliding all around on the cutting board, right? So I make a few slices going horizontally, but not all the way through. I made four slices going up. So can you see those? Mm -hmm. So four slices, and then I'm going to go the other direction, but not go all the way through again. And then, so basically I've created a grid, and my, you see how my onion is still totally together? Does anybody have problems when they dice an onion, and it just is like falling all over your cutting board, and you're trying to get a nice dice on it, but you can't? I do. It's Elizabeth says I do. It's usually because your root end isn't still intact. So if you can manage to leave that together, it's going to be a lot easier to dice it. So try to leave it together next time. I don't really cut any of you do that. I do is when I dice other stuff that happens too. Yeah, it's true. So then we'll go across and we'll have a nice dice here. And when you get to the end, I just cut around the root and get little small bits. So who out there uses chard on a regular basis? Anybody? Do you like chard? Yeah, it is, it is a good tip. It's, a lot of people struggle with that, I find in my cooking classes, that they cut all the way through. I'm crying right now. Are you gonna cry too? No. It's a really strong onion. I'm gonna do anything. Ugh. Look, can you read the recipe and see if we need any garlic? Oh yeah. Two Ooh. cloves. All right. Two cloves minced. Can you mince the garlic? What does that mean? Finely chopped. Right, finely chopped. So Elizabeth's gonna mince some garlic for me. You could also. Do you want to use the microplane? Okay. Okay. I think this is two cloves, but this is like a giant clove. Maybe just use one of them then. So we have one giant clove we're going to use, and instead of mincing it, we're actually going to use the microplane here, which basically creates a paste. I can't bring it apart. And she'll peel that. We'll go from there. So what do we have? The onion. Oh, we got to remember to do the stems with the onion. Can I cut that? Yeah, you can cut some of them. Okay. So here I have my stems. They're kind of like celery, and some of them have a similar flavor. Thank you, Sasha. And I'm just going to make them a little bit smaller. I'm cutting them in half lengthwise so that they're not huge, huge pieces. Some of these are gigantic. That's gigantic. I'm actually just going to cut it in half lengthwise. And just so I'm creating a dice, just like with the uh, onion, similar size. And I'm going to cut actually the end, the tip off because it's a little bit brown. Um, yeah, I think that's okay. So Elizabeth's just grating the garlic into the, the onion here. And then I'm going to cut the char into small bite-sized pieces. I always thought that was celery. Maybe. Yeah, it looks like celery. You okay? Yeah. Make sure you're getting, if you're not, go ahead and bang it on there to get it out. You got to push really hard. Yeah, push really hard on that. You can always put this down on here. Yeah. There you go. So because the charred stems and the onions are kind of similar, they're crunchy, they're a little bit thicker than the actual leaves, I will cut those first. I mean, cook those first is what I will do. Can I just cut it? It's like easy. Sure. If I just cut it. Sure, go ahead. So I have my rainbow chard stems, my onion, using the whole thing here. Liz is just mincing the garlic, making it nice and small. You can do it on a microplane if you want, or you can mince it. 
And then I'm just sticking every whoop, everything in a bowl here. The onions underneath of this, the, um, the charred stems on the top, and we'll throw the garlic in there too. Oh, do you want to do these too? Yeah, don't I mince it? Cause I'm not, okay. There's nothing's happening. <laughs> so mincing the garlic, oh, I gotta take your here. So she's gonna cut some more charred stems. Yeah. I'm just gonna run my knife through here to mince the garlic. And to do the mincing, I keep my tip of the knife on the cutting board and I just go back and forth through it. It's a lot easier than the than picking it up to me. I like to just keep my knife, my tip of my knife down. And there's more stems. Great. It doesn't have to be super duper fine. So we get our nice, everything we're cooking together right here. And then I will show you the charred leaves, which we'll add afterward. Oh my gosh, she's huge. So here we have these nice charred leaves, right, <laughs> where the stem came out. And I'm going to do what's called chiffonade them, which is basically make ribbons out of them. So I'm going to stack, not all the leaves at once, but two or three leaves at a time, just on top of each other like that. And I'm going to roll them up like this. Okay, I'm just going to follow what you do. That's perfect. Just wait a minute. Okay. So I, I got a nice roll here, and then I'm gonna go run my knife through them, keeping my fingers tucked under so I don't get my finger. And what I'm going to end up with is what's called a chiffonade or a ribbon. And it's a nice thin way to cut them kind of evenly. And kind of have long pieces. You can also cut them up with, with your hand if you, uh, with, tear them apart with your hand if you wanted to. Totally fine. It's not possible. Okay. Because, like, none of the pieces are the same size. Okay. I'll show you how to do that. So what you do when none of the pieces are the same size, you just kind of do your best, right? So see how they're all kind of different sizes here? I'm just still going to stack them so they're all kind of one. And then I'm just going to roll it up the best that I can. It's hard for you, babe, because you have a small cutting board. Maybe get the bigger cutting board, the yellow one. Do I have to? I guess not, but it's just going to be easier. The middle part's good, the ends are not. Careful, you see how you're cutting? There's a hole in the cutting board that's not going to cut very well. She's cutting on a super tiny cutting board. So we got our nice little pile of chard here. And it's okay if there's a little bit of stem left in there. It's fine. And these little pieces I'm just going to throw in the pile, they're already little. And then these last pieces, which are actually a little bit um, smaller, I'm just going to cut. I stacked them all and I'm not bothering to roll them because they're actually quite small. But I did stack them, I'm just going to cut them through as well. So I know this looks like a big pile of greens here, but greens cook down like crazy. And this dish maybe will serve four? Kind of depends on how big of green eaters you are. And if you wanted to make it more of a, a main course too, you can also add um, like some chickpeas or some cooked lentils or something. I'm also, I'm working on a recipe right now that uses ground lamb. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna be doing that one next week too. Super delicious way to get your greens with the ground meat. Are we missing anything? What do we need? Pine Who's drinking wine? I am. Say, mm. Can you get the feta cheese out? The feta cheese. Can you get the feta cheese out? I think it's a uh, top in like a package. So the other thing in this recipe is feta cheese. 
And then pine nuts. And I don't have any pine nuts on hand today. I forgot to look before I went to the grocery store. Can I open it? Sure. Clean your cutting board first. Wash it? Yeah. So I'm using pepitas instead. So pepitas are pumpkin seeds, basically. And you can use any kind of nut that you have on hand that you like. I'm using pepitas. You could use a walnut. You could use a sunflower seed, almond, hazelnut. What else? I kind of just mix it up depending on what I have on hand. Pine nuts are also pretty pricey, so if you're not feeling it that day, totally use something else. It's totally fine. Totally allowed. Okay, so how do I do this? Do I like hang, on, hang on one second, Sorry. okay? So what I'm going to do with the pine nuts is I'm going to toast them. Can you see? I don't think you can see that. I'm going to just toast them stove top here. I'm going to put them in a dry pan with nothing else in there over like a medium heat. I'm toasting them separately than from the dish itself, yeah? So I'm just gonna put them in a dry pan, put them on like a medium, medium high heat and watch them carefully. I'm really good at burning nuts and seeds, so hopefully I won't do that. What does it say to do with the feta cheese? Crumbled feta cheese. Crumbled. And it says two to three ounces, I think, so it's like maybe half of that. So like open like the whole thing and like... Let's just get out half of it and crumble half of it. Like, like that? And yeah. Then, like, cut it out? Yeah, sure. That looks good. So if you have... We're using feta cheese here and this just goes on top at the end. If you have um, goat cheese too, that's super delicious. Um, I like the feta because it adds a, a nice bit of salt in there. The goat cheese isn't as salty. I like the feta for the saltiness. Can I it with my hands? Yeah, please do. And then we'll get started. Stove to oh wait, I can't let these pepitas burn. How long do the pepitas like on there? I don't know, maybe five minutes. The thing with doing nuts on the stove top or in the oven too is that you want to be sure to have a container to put them into right next to them because if you keep them in the hot pan they'll continue to cook even after you pull them off the heat so if you're sitting there cooking them and you're like oh they're starting to burn and then you pull them off the heat and you don't pour them into something else they'll continue to cook and burn so whenever i do nuts on the stove top i always make sure that i have a little bowl next to me where i'm just going to pour them right away when they're done and this is my little bowl <laughs> And um, when it starts, when the nuts start to smell, when they start to become fragrant and they'll start to pop a little bit, the pepita specifically will start to pop a little bit and um, they'll start to brown as well a little bit. Uh, you can add a little bit of salt to them if you like as well. And that timer is our sweet potato, so I'm going to check on that. The goat, no, I got cheese. The feta is approved. The feta is approved. All right. Good to hear. So let's get something to test these with. So these sweet potatoes seem pretty done to me. Ah, I'm going to go five more minutes with them. They're not quite soft. So I'm testing the sweet potatoes. I put them in a small bowl so they're not as hot to eat them yet. Agreed, Alex. <laughs> Make double the amount of toasted nuts so that you can eat half of them. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, so the sweet potatoes were almost done. I tested them, not with a knife. If you test things for doneness with a knife, um, you will more likely go all the way through because a knife is sharp, right? It's best to test them with like a fork or something that's not as sharp. This is a spatula, so I just tried to poke through there. And there was a little bit of resistance. I wanted them a little bit softer. So I'm going to wait. And my pepitas are... Popping, I hear them. They're starting to brown up a little bit. And you can add a little bit of salt to the pepitas too, which is what I'm going to do. Give them a little bit more flavor. Sounds 
The goat cheese kind of tastes like blue cheese, but not. The feta cheese? The feta. I keep so I just um, brown these up until they're a little bit toasty and they plump up actually a little bit too start to lose their skin a little bit you smell them yeah yeah so they they smell a little bit roasty toasty we have our crumbled feta cheese here for the top of the chard and then we'll get started with our chard actually. so what do you do with the chard you heat up heat up the pan what does it say on the recipe it says Hmm. In a large saute pan, heat olive oil over medium heat. How much olive oil? Hmm. Two tablespoons. So we're going to heat our two tablespoons of olive oil over medium heat. That's already high. Turn it down a little bit. One, two. Tasha said her potatoes are still rock hard. What? Why? How big did you cut them? 425, right? Hi, Peter. Thanks. <laughs> Just keep going. Are they getting super brown, Sasha? Uh, what am I going to do? Is she making this as she's watching? Yeah, I think Sasha's making this as she's going. So what does it say to... <laughs> you suck. You don't suck. You just gotta cut them smaller, probably. Maybe, probably. Yeah, turn it up. Just watch. Make sure they don't brown too much. They don't burn. Um. So what do I do? I add the. So with the chard, we're gonna do saute the stems, the onion, and the garlic for a little bit. Add salt and cinnamon also. Okay, great. How much salt and cinnamon? Um, half a teaspoon. Of salt and a fourth a teaspoon of cinnamon. <laughs> you got a compliment. Cool. One of Faraday's friends. I Hi. assume. Hi. Thanks for stopping by. Um, so we're going to put the chard stems and onion and garlic in there with the salt and cinnamon. She's going to put it in there. Oh, what I was going to say is you want to make sure that oil's hot before you add the onion and chard stems. Why? Because if you add the onion to the cold oil, it will soak, the onion will like soak up the oil and it will take on more of a soggy consistency rather than um, a crisper consistency, if that makes sense. Yeah? I know, I like that bowl too, Sasha. It's my brand new favorite bowl. So Elizabeth is adding, how much cinnamon did you add? So in this recipe too, also cinnamon, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, just a touch, and then what was that like a half a teaspoon, of, a half a teaspoon of fine sea salt. How much salt was that? Half a teaspoon. Yeah, and I add the salt at the beginning for two reasons: one, to build layers of flavor. I always add the salt in the beginning, and two, to help the veggies actually break down. That salt's going to help the vegetables break down a little bit faster. That's for any vegetables that you're sauteing. I always add salt in the beginning and in the middle and in the end. And it doesn't make salty food. It just makes food that tastes like what it is, if that makes sense. Makes it taste good. So that's our timer. Yeah, can you move? Test those sweet potatoes again. They're looking good. They don't look that much different than from when I put them in. Because of that spice mix on top looks is brown anyways. But you can tell they're a little bit blistery. They're soft. Mm. Yeah, and if you flip them over, you can flip them halfway through cooking. I didn't I didn't bother to do that, but if you want both sides evenly brown, you can totally do that. So we're just going to let them cool. I stir around the charge. Thank you. I don't know how well Let's I just make sure it's right over there. No. Yeah. So with this particular sweet potato recipe, um, it doesn't make the sweet potatoes crisp mm -hmm. necessarily. And if you wanted them to be crispy outside, like deep fried outside, <laughs> 
She'll be available for hire soon, I promise. <laughs> um, so if you want them to get crispy on the outside, the thing that you need to do actually is soak them beforehand to get rid of some of the excess starch. And then you'll get more of a crispy potato. That's one way to do it. I don't bother to do that for usually for weeknight recipes because it takes a little bit of time, at least a half an hour, to soak them. So these are nice wedges, but they're not like super crispy like a fried potato. But if you wanted to make them crispy, soak them beforehand for like 30 minutes in a big old bowl of water and then rinse them until the water runs clear. All that starch will be coming off and then your potatoes will get nice and crispy. So that's one way to do it. Yeah. So we're waiting for the onion and the charred stems. While we're waiting, do you want to put, um, can you put these on here? The potatoes. Yeah, let's let that cool off. It's, it's really hot because it's on top. Let's turn this yeah. off. We, go. Well, we can let that cool a little bit. And then what happens after? Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? What's cool about the char dish, I think I said this earlier, it can be served cold or at room temperature too. And you can serve it with like a side of lemon as well. I don't think the recipe says that in there, but if you want, you can serve it with a side of lemon too. Super yum. So what, what do we do with the char? What does it say? Okay. Uh, cook the stuff for five minutes, add the charred leaves and cook. Stir it occasionally until charred is bright green and mm. barely wilting. Okay, so we're going to add the char and cook it for just about three minutes, which isn't very long. And there's enough water on here to help the, um, from rinsing the char to help it cook a little bit. It will seem like a lot for the pan, but it's going to cook down really fast. Can you put a, another quarter in there? So I'm, I'm having Elizabeth put another quarter of a teaspoon of salt in the chard because that salt, besides adding flavor, will help the chard leaves break down a little bit faster too, like I was saying. So here I'm, um, I'm salting in, watch out for this, it's very hot. I'm salting in layers, right, to get layers of flavor. What I'm doing here, I have this nice long platter here. I'm going to go ahead and just put my sweet potatoes on there. Oh, this is seriously hot. And I'm just going, I'm just sticking my um, garlic cloves in there on the plate, like I was saying earlier. I don't mind. They're just nice roasted garlic cloves. They're like a treat to me. If you don't like them or you don't want your guests... Um, or your family biting into garlic cloves, just leave them out. Cook's treat. So, can you stir that for me? Anything else that goes in there? Uh, Besides the, the, we can put the pepitas over the top. Um, so here's my nice... Add black pepper. Oh. You can look Go ahead and add some black pepper that just right into there, can you? How much? I don't know. So, uh huh. She's adding a little bit of black pepper in there. So we have the sweet potato wedges, and then if you want, because the um, chard has cheese on it, I'm just gonna leave the sweet potatoes without cheese. But you could totally sprinkle this with some goat cheese or some feta cheese as well. And then here comes the pomegranate molasses. Totally not necessary, but super delicious. A little bit tart. Tiny bit sweet, not super sweet, but the tartness, and it adds just a beautiful color, a deep red color. This I got at the Middle Eastern Grocery Store. You can get it online. Um, you can make your own if you want to let pomegranate juice boil down for hours and hours and hours. I agree. That is why I leave the garlic in there, because <laughs> I know it's, a, it's good for me. Um, and when you're buying the pomegranate syrup, if you can, just try to make sure that the first ingredient isn't sugar. There's a lot of brands out there, and a lot of times the first ingredient will be sugar. It's okay if there's some sugar in it, but you don't want the first ingredient to be sugar. You want to really have that tartness of the syrup. 
can I add cheese? No, we're gonna save the cheese for the um, for the chard. Mm -hmm. Where is that store in Long Beach? The Middle Eastern store is actually in Fountain Valley. It's pretty close to you, Alex. Um, on Warner and Brookhurst, there's a Middle Eastern grocery. Um, there are Turks. It's there's a whole little area. There's a Turkish um, bakery, Ikram Bakery, and then there's a Turkish uh, grocery. It's a Middle Eastern grocery called Hamle, and it's right on Warner and Brookhurst. Message me for the for the. Um, for the exact name and everything, but it's really close to you. You could get, get there really quickly. That's where I get stuff if I absolutely need it, like today, that I'll drive down there, otherwise I'll order stuff online. There's also Super King, which is in Stanton. Yeah, there you go, there's King Market. If you're in Laguna, there's Super, is that Super King? Is that the same? And then there's Wholesome Choice too, which is like an Irvine? Yeah, there's a few choices around. So here's my syrup, and you'll see the syrup has a big wide opening. So I just put my finger over it, and I drizzle. You don't want too much. Looks like chocolate syrup. It looks like chocolate syrup, that's true. So there you go, just a little bit of drizzling. I don't know how your guys' Thanksgiving is, but there's often kind of a wait for the oven at our Thanksgiving or a lineup for the oven where everybody's trying to get their thing in the oven. What I like about this is that you can make this ahead of time and serve at room temperature. It, I wouldn't refrigerate it, but it would be totally fine to make it ahead of time and then like bring it to the party that you're, the gathering that you're going to and just serve at room temperature would be great, especially with some cheese sprinkled on it. It'd be really good. We need a container for the chard. I'll be right back. Great. So this chard's just about done. I'll put the chard in the... Dan! Hi! You're here at the end to eat. I wouldn't expect anything less. Who? <laughs> Dan. Melina's <Okay>. dad. <laughs> Let's see about a serving bowl. So let's put our chard in here. Yum! I'll bring you some. <laughs> you should bring some to Sunday dinner or something. Oh. So you can let this chard go really as long as you want. I like, watch out, right behind you. I like my greens a little bit on the bright green side, not as soft and smushy. The chard stems are actually still crunchy here, which I prefer. And I'm gonna go ahead and plate it up now. But you can let it go, cover it for gosh, another 10, 15, 20 minutes if you like it really super duper soft. Kind of up to you. Look at what Dan said. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And so then I have my chard, you can put it in a serving dish, and then while it's warm, you can put the cheese on it if you want. And then I have the pepitas too, or the pine nuts, or the walnuts, or the almonds, or the hazelnuts, or whatever it is that you want to use. And I just sprinkle them on the top. That's such a satisfying pan. What's yeah. that? What'd you say? It's so satisfying. Oh. Crinkle, crinkle. So I'll just put them on the top, cheese. and then I'll do the cheese on the top too. Tastes kind of like blue cheese. Does it? So there's the chard with pumpkin seeds and feta cheese on it. So if you haven't found the recipes yet, they're at my website, agoodcarrot.com. That's it. We're going to go eat some vegetables. Sasha, are your potatoes done yet? And does anybody have any questions? Thank you for coming by. I'm going to do two more Tuesday night dinner demos in October. I'm not sure what I'm making yet. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Either write it in the messages here or direct message me or comment 
or email me. Let me know if there's anything specific that you would like to see made. I will happily make it. I'm just going simp doing simple dishes and dinners that I typically make for my family. What is that? Does that sound good? Okay. Have a good night, you guys. We'll see you next week, 7 o'clock, Tuesday night. Chef Aaliyah, sous chef Elizabeth, signing off. All right. Can you press finish? Bye. Bye.